Welcome to the Alain Guillot Podcast, a podcast about life, leadership, and money matters. Our guest today is Ted Saidis. Ted is a CFA charter holder, and he has spent 25 years in the, as an institutional investor. He's also the host of the Capital Allocator Podcast, a podcast with over 5 million downloads where he explores the best practices in the asset management industry. And today, we will speak about his new book, Capital Allocator, How the World's Elite Money Managers Lead and Invest. Ted, thank you so much for joining me today. Alain, thanks so much for having me. So Ted, as I told you a minute ago, I have listened to over 100 episodes of your podcast. And well, it's, it's an insight of uh, how money manager manage their money, but also their personal life and how they make it all work together. So it's just, it's just incredible because these people run the pension funds that manage our money. And we actually know very little about them. They practically run our life and we know nothing about them. And you kind of open the curtain or open the kimono and, and let us see what's going on inside of their office. So thank you so much for the great work that you do. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. So Ted, uh, you go in your book on how the idea to start your podcast came about. Could you share that with the listeners? Sure. Uh, it, it was one of the first, if not the first thing I had done in my professional career that had no objective to it. Uh, I had left the world of institutional investing in, in 2015, and I was thinking about different things to do next. And as I was, I'd have consulting projects and, and a bunch of different things came up. And along the way, I just thought it would be fun to run around and talk to some of my old friends and see what they were up to and see if I'd get them to record it. And this medium had just sort of started taking off. So I just started it as just a use of my time I thought would be a productive use of my time. And one by one, it just kept going and the audience started growing and I, I kept going. And a couple of years later, it was pretty clear that it had become the largest use of my time. And so I've built a whole uh, series of small businesses around it um, so I could keep doing it because it's a tremendous amount of fun. Okay, so you started doing it by phone. You started doing it on a weekly basis, I assume? Yeah. And uh, how do you start picking up your guests uh, out of your professional life? You you probably told yourself, oh, it would be nice to talk to this guy and then the other one. And is that how it went? That is how it started. I, I think of the first 50 guests, maybe 45 or 46 were people I had known and was friends with from my career. Uh, and I knew they were very interesting and not often in public. And then the rest of it evolved very much in the same way when you're managing a portfolio investing in managers, which is ideas come to you. It might be ideas about markets. It might be certain people. And you just sort of go where you think there's something to learn and something interesting to talk about. So it's really been that type of exploration over the last four years. The hardest aspect of it for me is to describe to other people who's coming on the show and why. Uh, because I don't have a, there's not a rigorous process to it. Sometimes it's someone makes an interesting referral and I talk to them and I say, wow, I'd, I'd love to learn more about what they're doing. What a great format to do it. Other times it's a little bit topical based on what I sense people are particularly interested in and want to learn about. And so I'll, you know, source a few people to talk to in, in different spaces. So there's no real pattern to it. It's, it's just wanting to continue to compound great relationships and knowledge. Well, the majority of podcast listeners, they probably are under the impression that to produce a podcast, all you have to do is grab a microphone and have a conversation with someone. But you and I know that there is a lot of work involved in that. And in fact, there's so much work in, involved in podcasting that most podcasters fail. It's called, there is a term called pod fade which means people just after, I don't know, maybe I think the the line is after 50 podcasts, if they are not getting rich or they are not famous, they just, <laughs> they just decide, well, this is not for me. So 
order to ask you what kept you going uh, at one moment did you realize that this is something that you will be doing for a long time it took a while uh i didn't have a problem finding people to talk to but it was always alongside of other things i was doing to you know say put food on the table and um, I never knew how long it would go because of that. Sometimes I felt like it was taking too much of my time and I wanted to slow down the cadence. Other times I'd have so many people I wanted to talk to that I wondered if it, you know, I needed to speed up. Um, but it wasn't until about three years in when the largest uh, project I had been working on ended and I wasn't sure exactly what would happen next that it was clear that because of the audience, the audience was drawing in advertisers. And I had people reaching out to me to advertise on the show. And it was very easy for me to understand why they wanted to advertise. Um, so it was about, I started the show in 2017. And I would say it was in early 2020 uh, when that was the first time I said, okay, this will become the kind of the hub of a hub and spoke of activities that, uh, that I'm working on and been you know, growing it since. Well, and do you do anything to promote your podcast other than creating great material? I mean, I assume some of your guests share with their network, but uh, is that mostly how you, you have grown your podcast? So far, that's been it. it. It may change going forward, but I, the way I describe it is I promote it on LinkedIn and Twitter and my accounts. But when I started the podcast, I didn't do anything on LinkedIn and Twitter. So I'm not sure if people got to LinkedIn and Twitter because of the podcast or they got to the podcast because of LinkedIn and Twitter, but it was all together. No paid promotion or anything. I just would share what I was doing in those formats um, and then found different ways to share the content. Um, but there has been no, up until now, we haven't really looked at it as a business with any attempt to say, if this is a business, how would we monetize it? Uh, but now for the first time, we're thinking about some of those things. It's really fun to think about. Wow, great. Okay, let's talk for a minute about your uh, professional career. You spent 25 years as an institutional investor. What exactly were you doing? And, and what is it that guides you towards investment? Is this something that you have always loved to do or do you get that by Harperstan? Yeah, well, I was, I, I would say I was curious about it when I came out of college, but I didn't know anything. I didn't really even know what a stock was. And I was very fortunate that my first job out of college, I went and worked at the Yale University Endowment uh, with David Swenson, who just you know, sadly passed away last week. Um, and he stirred a passion, uh, not only for investing, but for investing in people which is really the style that he pursued investing in managers. So I spent five years working at Yale with David, and that's where I really learned and grew a passion for investing. Um, and then after I left, I went to business school from there, and I thought I wanted to participate more directly in the markets. And I had a few different work experiences in public equity and private equity, trying to find my footing in that. And, and I just didn't quite find it. So I went back to the manager selection side of things and formed a partnership with someone else back in 2001 and launched a fund in 2002 um, that I ran for 14 years until I decided to leave and, and try to figure out what would come next. And here we are. Okay. So you are an advocate for active asset management and i love myself active asset management i love buying my stocks and doing the research and doing some hedging you know but i find it frustrating since the government gets involved in the market so much i have find myself you know i do some hedging to prepare against a downturn here and there and then the government comes in and throws a whole a huge amount of capital and my whole hedging uh, strategy goes down the tube. So I wonder, I wonder what's the position of active assets management, having the government as a playmate in that field? <laughs> well, Charter, uh, it, it, you know, active management, the pursuit of active management doesn't really start at that level. It starts at the level of trying to pursue opportunities and inefficiencies and trying to add value over and above what anybody can access you know, quite easily through index funds or ETFs or whatever the case may be. And so um, 
you know, there's one question of what's changed because the government's come in, and that's one of many factors that make active management particularly difficult. But the pursuit of active management, there are many, many people trying to do it, and not many win, maybe half win, half win, right. half lose, maybe a little bit less than half win. Um, and so the pursuit that I was engaged in was trying to figure out who were the ones that were more likely to win. It wasn't about how do we respond to what the Fed's doing. And that has much more to do with structure and strategy and team. And then like anything else in investing, going through many, many repetitions to start to calibrate the universe and understand, okay, Elaine, where do you sit as an individual behind a microphone compared to the thousand other people pursuing the same types of strategy? Where are your competitive advantages? Where are their competitive advantages? And then trying to partner with the best among them. <laughs> Okay, wow. Well, I guess I, I, I found it frustrating many times. I, I, I would do bets and then here will come the Fed in the US or the European Central Bank as well, just destroying my whole. So I, I, in most part, I have given up. <laughs> I've become an index investor as well. Uh, okay, so let's go back to your podcast. So you have interviewed uh, over 150 individuals, uh, uh, well, that you portray in the book. Uh, can you share, I don't know, one or two stories that you want to highlight from, from the book? Sure. Well, the book's broken down into three parts. There's a part that I call the toolkits, a second part, investment frameworks, and the third, nuggets of wisdom. Um, and the genesis of the book comes from this premise, much, Elaine, like you said, with the Fed coming in, interest rates very low, uh, stock market multiples very high, if investors want to go into the marketplace and just own these index assets that are easy to do, it sure doesn't look like they'll be generating the kinds of returns that will meet their spending needs. And then, you know, that is it an individual or an endowment or a pension fund. Uh, they all have either clearly articulated or less well articulated investment and spending needs. And so, the first part of the book recognizes that and says, okay, if in fact the, your, your margin of safety over what you need to achieve for spending is much more narrow than it was, what else can you do to add value? What else can you do to make sure that your team that you're managing money with uh, goes about that pursuit in the most efficient way possible? And, and there are a bunch of lessons that I learned from interviewing people that are investing lessons, but they're not investing disciplines. So things like the art of interviewing, because many people go out, they interview management teams, or in my world, they're interviewing money managers. Well, how do you do that effectively? The decision-making process, which in the past, uh, in, in the distant past of my career, there wasn't a lot of information about um, behavioral finance. And then there was a whole world of information about behavioral finance. In the last few years, there's a lot more about decision-making science. How do you take the problems that befell all of us because of the way our brains are wired and making decisions and make better decisions. And then things like leadership and management, because many of these people run organizations that are making investment decisions. Well, how do you lead better and how do you manage people effectively? So those are all things that are incredibly important to ultimately getting at investment outcomes. Um, but in the past, money managers were particularly not well known for being good people managers, and they didn't pay attention to some of these disciplines. And now I think it will be increasingly important for people to do so. So there's a whole set of conversations, you know, on decision making with people like Annie Duke, the, for, the famous former professional poker player and decision strategist, and Michael Mobison. Uh, in leadership, there's some terrific, I interviewed a, a, de a decorated Marine veteran in the U.S. who's an old friend of mine, to people like Greg Fleming, who, run, who runs Rockefeller Capital Management and happens to be just a gifted leader more than any other skill set that he has. That's probably his best skill set. Uh, to Randall Stutman, who's probably the, the top and least well-known executive coach, uh, just an extraordinary person. Uh, who's coached many people in the money management industry about how to be a more effective and admired leader. Uh, so there are a bunch of those conversations that aren't directly about investing, but they're about those skills. Okay, so in that vein, um, what have you learned about how to interview effectively? You have been doing it as a money manager and, I mean, as an asset allocator and now as a podcaster. So uh, let's say what are some lessons that you could share with someone who interviews people regularly or like me who has a podcast and interview people regularly? 
Yeah, I think there's a framework you can think about about how to make that process better. So it starts with what's the purpose of the interview. Uh, and it's often surprising that if you really get to the authentic purpose of an interview, that people don't always get that right. So one great example is in my role as an allocator to money managers, you would think that the purpose of the interview is to go and learn as much as you can about the manager. But there are lots of allocators who subconsciously think the, the purpose of the interview is for them to sound smart. Mm. Now, those two things take on a very different uh, application if you're actually, if you're imagining, if, if I think it's my purpose is to sound smart, I, I will have a different interaction with that manager than I will if I'm trying to learn. Um, so that's just one example, setting the purpose of the interview. There's some things that go into the, the, the setting that you're in, right? If, if the purpose is to learn, how do you, do you want to be in a conference room where you're across the table from someone and that's kind of a confrontational setting? Or you're better off wandering through the woods with someone and having an open conversation, right? So you can imagine different opportunities to figure out who's sitting around the table. Is it a round table, a square table? Are you in an office? Are you outside an office? And then you get into the whole process of listening. And what I found from both from interviews and some life experience that whether you're talking about hostage negotiation or business negotiations or couples relationship therapy, they all have the same principles, the same core principles of what active listening means. And so I walk through those in the book and just describe if you want to listen actively, how do you do it? Um, and then at the end of it is a feedback loop, which is most of the time we have interviews, we go and we think about what happened in the interview. Did, was it a good, did, did I like the money manager? Do I think that's a company I want to invest with? We don't often step back and say, how did I perform as an interviewer and how can I get better as an interviewer? So all of those things. And then there are a few, there are a few little smaller kind of nuggets and lessons that I kind of picked up along the way that are in that chapter as well. How do you find the critique that uh, interviewers are oftentimes uh, looking for a reflection of themselves, someone who goes to the same kind of school, someone who has similar cultural background, et cetera, et cetera. And sometimes the process of interviewing is uh, hampers diversity, let's say in our work workspace. Yeah. Well, it may or may not matter, right? It, it depends right up front to what's the purpose of that interview. Uh, so there's there's a question of do is are you trying to create some type of diversity of the conversation in that interview, or you can move that over to the decision making process where we we know from the science that having cognitive diversity in decision making processes is a more effective process in getting to a good decision than just trying to do it on your own or having people around the table that are exactly like you. So, you know, it really depends on what you're trying to accomplish and whether that, you know, is something that makes a big difference or not. Okay, and in the topic of leadership, what are one or two nuggets of wisdom that you could share with the, our listeners that sure. you have learned? Well, the most important feature of leadership is setting a vision mm. um, and really understanding at the highest level, what are you trying to accomplish? And, and people do that often through, uh, it might be a, a vision statement or a statement of values is also part of that. So just to give you an example, uh, we created that for capital allocators. And we said the vision of capital allocators is to learn, share and implement the process of elite investors. And the way we were going to do that was through what we call compounding knowledge and relationships. And so one of the guys on my team this morning, we were talking about a particular business opportunity. And he said, well, if we do it this way, we can learn this and we can share that. And that sounds like it's pretty consistent with what we're trying to do. And I said, yeah, that's great. Is this a compounding relationship or is it a transactional relationship? He said, well, it's a little bit transactional. I said, okay, that, then we have to think about that. Is that what we're trying to do? So it filters from everything for how you're spending your time to how you behave. So that's the first big piece is that vision and a statement of vision and values. The next is standards, which is if you take those values, a lot of people have value statements on their wall. They're only effective if the leader meets them. So the, the leader has to not just say, this is what we believe, they have to act that way because it's their actions much more than the words that will, will allow people to follow. Uh, and then from that, you go into a layer of communication, which is this constant reiteration 
of what that vision is and that constant practice of the values and the day-to-day -day activities. Um, and then you can go on from there. But those are some of the key principles that, that you'll find, you know, this is not, I, I did not write a chapter that was the definitive guide of leadership. But if you read lots of leadership books, you do get to a very similar framework of how successful leaders operate. Okay, uh, well, one more question. In the topic of investing, you live in a bubble that all you eat, breathe, and sleep investing. You, you know, you are always up to date with what's going on in the investing world. But most North Americans are not like that. In fact, most North Americans are oblivious. They, you know, they hardly know how the stock market works. And I think you're doing a great job via your podcast, sharing your knowledge. But uh, what, are, what are some other ways that could, we could entice more Americans to become more interested on what's going on in the world of finance? You know, how their money works, how they're going to plan for their retirement. And I guess to have a vague knowledge of the uh, financial structures that govern their life. Yeah. Well, I would start by saying the good news is that although the press will often have very high profile stories of how terrible people are in this world, mm. what I, you know, what I have hoped to share on the podcast is there are a lot of very talented, very smart, very hardworking people that are working towards bettering people's retirements and, you know, increasing the opportunities in education and hospitals and all kinds of things. So the good news is it's not so important for everybody to know everything. Um, there are lots of ways and increasingly uh, people finding ways to get people up the financial literacy curve. Um, I think where just because of the nature of my career, that's not really the, the place. Like I would not call my podcast Investing 101 at all. Um, there's a lot of lingo. There's a lot of uh, kind of sophistication that goes into the conversations. Um, and I'm not even sure, I don't think I'm the best person to ask about where should someone go if they want to just start at the beginning. You know, for me, it was a full education in the CFA program that you mentioned, which is a tremendous funding block, uh, building block and body of knowledge. But that's three years worth of coursework. So it's not uh, not for everybody. Yeah, uh, just to let you know, I failed the level one CFA exam twice and then I gave up. <laughs> well, Ted, this is a fascinating conversation. Uh, I wonder if you could tell us one more time the, type, the title of your book and where can people find the podcast? Sure. Thanks, Elaine. Uh, so everything is under the name Capital Allocators. We have a website, capitalallocators.com. The book is called Capital Allocators and is available on Amazon. The, the podcast is called Capital Allocators and is available at, you know, on any mobile device. Well, thank, Ted, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Elaine.